It's been three years since the worst loss of Cindy's life. One day she lost both her husband and her child. But nothing foretold this tragedy. That morning, Perry went fishing. Fishing was his passion. Sometimes, he would bring in a bag of fish and, with a satisfied look on his face, put his catch in front of Cindy. And she put her hands down helplessly. What's the point of all this? And who will take care of it? No, Perry was helping her clean it, fry it and put it in the freezer. But she mostly gave it to the neighbors. She didn't mind, she'd catch more. And Cindy, though she was pumping, but without much effort. What can you do if you married a keen fisherman? Perry had a special lake, far from the city, near the forest. It was beautiful there. He took Cindy there too. She loved it. But she couldn't stay more than an hour. All the beauty of the local scenery was erased as soon as the mosquito repellent stopped working. But instead, five-year-old Alvin fell in love with the place like his father. He was simply delighted when Perry took him and his mother to this forest lake. And here's that fateful Saturday. Alvin had convinced his father to take him with him since the evening. Perry discouraged him at first, telling him he'd have to get up early because the lake would be wet. And mosquitoes again. But Alvin only got angrier. As mother will say, finally Perry waved his hand. If she will come with us and take care of you, then I agree. Cindy said a firm no, but the sun continued to be capricious, Cindy, maybe we'll go together then? Perry looked at her questioningly. Alvin, realizing that his fate was being decided, froze and looked pleadingly at his mother. His eyes, blue as a bottomless sky, eyelashes dark and long like a girl's. How much her son resembled her. They say if a boy looks like his mother, he'll be happy. How could Cindy refuse her beloved son? Okay, go. But don't go away from dad and don't go into the water, she said with deliberate strictness. Alvin shrieked with delight. Perry smiled satisfied. Yes, his son would follow in his footsteps. Early Saturday morning, Cindy went out to spend her son and husband in front of the block. She lingered a while, looking for the SUV, then went to bed. It wasn't even five o'clock yet. When the phone rang, Cindy was still mumbling in her sleep, who's there so insistently on a Saturday? Her husband's name appeared on the screen. Cindy raised her eyebrows in astonishment and yawned, and why is it ringing? He's supposed to be standing on the shore with his fishing rod, right? She didn't feel a twitch, no sense of foreboding. Then he heard an unfamiliar male voice. For the first few seconds, he thought he hadn't woken up yet. It's a dream. A terrible dream. And then, as the taxi flew to the morgue, she prayed for one thing, that it was just a mistake. But there was no mistake. Perry and Alvin were dead. That morning they never made it to their favorite lake. On the way out of town, a truck crashed into them from the oncoming lane. They simply didn't stand a chance. Cindy could hardly remember the events that followed, the funeral, the funeral. It was a good thing there were relatives and friends nearby. They organized everything, they supported Cindy. And then the day came when she had to stay alone in an empty apartment, where everything reminded her of her husband and son. The thought of her son tore at her soul. She blamed herself for letting him go on that damned fishing trip. She scolded her late husband for agreeing with her, for not being able to dodge a truck driven by a drunk driver. She scolded and scolded and then howled like a wolf, in pain, in despair. Work kept her from going crazy. Cindy buried her head in reports, reports, took on extra responsibilities, just to not remember, not think about her son and husband. And yet these thoughts crept into her consciousness and poisoned her from within. After work, Cindy didn't want to go home. She kept wandering and wandering around the city. And it was only when she realized that she would soon collapse from exhaustion and hunger that she returned to her empty apartment. And there, once again, she released her tears. There's no telling how it would have ended, if it hadn't been for her wise friend named Anne. She insisted that Cindy sell the apartment, move to another neighborhood. Her husband and son's belongings, and insisted on throwing them away, but then Cindy rebelled. How could she throw away everything Alvin held dear? Then and proposed moving everything to the cottage in the country. To this compromise, Cindy agreed. And indeed, it was easier. No, Cindy didn't smile like that, she struggled at work until late at night, but at least, returning to the new apartment, she didn't cry at night. She simply fell asleep. And in the morning, she'd get up and go to work. And so, for three years like a robot, all her feelings froze, died that day she lost her dearest people. The new apartment was even closer to work than the old one. But Cindy didn't see this as an advantage. Now she was going to walk more to the cemetery. 
and she went there quite often, almost every week. Both her girlfriend and her parents had already begun to scold her for not doing that. She needed to put the pain aside. But the damn woman didn't listen to anyone. And after buying another toy, she went to the cemetery. That weekend, she didn't change her painful traditions. First by subway, then by minibus. Cindy got off at the terminus and walked slowly to the cemetery gates. The porter at the entrance greeted her as if she were already an acquaintance. She nodded habitually and, in her mournful thoughts, walked towards her family's graves, clutching a stuffed rabbit to her chest. Cindy only looked at her husband's monument, came to her son's grave, gently caressed the stone angel and the headstone, straightened the flowers and toys, added the bunny to their company, then, without strength, sank down beside him, my son, she whispered, massaging the earth on the grave with trembling fingers, little one. How bad I feel without you. I want to come to you, my darling, the tears flowed in rivers. She raised her eyes to the sky. Why? Why, God, have you made me suffer so much? Why? Take me too. Please. Her lips whispered weakly, and despair tore at her heart. And clouds floated in the sky. Somewhere in the sky, a lark's cry could be heard. It was so shrill. And its cry made her even more gloomy. Cindy lost track of time. She kept sitting and sitting, whispering something. Suddenly, she heard another cry. A child was crying. And that sound gave the distraught woman a boost. She woke up and looked around. The crying came from behind a lilac bush growing nearby. Serena rounded the bush and saw a little girl lying on the grave. She was hugging the ground, sitting face down. And she was crying, moaning something childish. The little girl was about six or seven years old. Cindy came closer and looked at the monument. In the photo, there was a smiling young girl who had died a year before. Mommy, take me home. I can't go on, I can't. I'm so sick with daddy, the girl complained. At these words, Cindy's heart tightened. Forgetting her pain, he came to the girl, sat down next to her and caressed her shoulder. At the touch, the child flinched and lifted her face. Their eyes met. The little girl had charming blue eyes, framed by long, dark lashes, just like Alvin's, Cindy thought painfully, hello. Cindy really tried to smile, though she didn't manage it very well. Who did you come with? The girl remained silent for a moment, staring intently at the sad blonde woman in the dark clothes, then sighed convulsively and whispered, with no one. I'm all alone here. I came to see my mother. Into Cindy's chest he stung again. Poor girl. She's suffering so much. At that moment a thought crossed her mind, but this girl is probably worse off than me. I'm an adult, I'm strong, but she. Why should she have to go through such an ordeal? Maybe I can do something to help her. But what? What's your name? Cindy asked the girl. Eliza, Eliza, how did you end up here alone? And the little girl, crying, confessed that she often comes to her mother's grave. She lives nearby with her father. He's a good man, said Eliza. Only, after my mother died, he started drinking. And I'm afraid to look at him like that. Cindy shook her head and sighed. Her own grief faded into the background. She asked herself, how to help the girl. That she wouldn't leave her here alone. Cindy took Eliza by the hand and they left the cemetery together. The girl confidently held her hand in Cindy's. At the gate they were greeted by the guard. Are you here too? He was astonished to see the girl. And how did you get here? Eliza didn't answer him, she just looked down. The old man told Cindy that this girl often ran to the cemetery. The bosses are already scolding him, a child is not allowed to be alone in such a place. The porter has chased her away several times, but she keeps sneaking in. It's understandable, he sighed. It's hard for an adult to lose his family, but a child. I feel sorry for the little girl. I don't understand why the guardianship isn't involved. Maybe you should call them, because it's not a good thing for a child to be wandering around cemeteries. I'd do it myself, but I don't want to get involved, we'll sort it out, Cindy nodded dryly, and pulled Eliza, who was clinging tightly to her hand. And already in front of the gate, the little girl spoke excitedly, Auntie, just don't send me to the orphanage. I don't want to go there. I'm afraid. My father is good. But he's not well either. Calm down, sweetie, Cindy replied as gently as possible. I won't send you anywhere. We'll eat at a cafe and then go to your place. Do you want to eat? The girl shyly lowered her eyes, shrugged her shoulders, swallowing hungry saliva. They went to a cafe not far from the cemetery 
and Cindy ordered Eliza a first course, a second course and juice. Then an ice cream. At the table, the girl told me she was six years old. She will go to school next year. Her father works in a big company. Before, when my mother was alive, he was kind, cheerful. Now he's always sullen. Lately, he rarely goes to work. They live in not far from here, just five stops away by minibus. But you can walk there too, Eliza explained, eating a scoop of ice cream. Walk? Well, it's a long way, Cindy was surprised. You can walk there, the girl sighed. I walked there a few times when they wouldn't let me get on the minibus. Why? The drivers asked me where my parents were, they said children shouldn't travel alone. I used to run away in such cases so that the police wouldn't be called. Listening to Eliza, Cindy nodded thoughtfully in response. So many times adults had seen a little girl on the transport to the cemetery and no one wanted to ask her why she was alone? Everyone was concerned not to get into trouble. Total indifference, well, shall we go home to daddy? Asked Cindy, after the little girl had eaten her ice cream. Eliza lowered her head, remained silent, then sighed, I think so, she answered uncertainly. Just don't call the police. I won't, promised the uncertain woman. They got to the right station, walked a bit and found themselves at a decent two-story cottage, is this your house? Cindy wondered. Yes, nodded the girl, and confidently pushed the iron gate. In the courtyard, the woman noticed that this had been a real flower paradise. Numerous flower beds spoke of it. But now they were overgrown with weeds. A beautiful gazebo, stone pathways, everything said that poor people didn't live here, but it was all somehow neglected. We used to have a housekeeper and a gardener, the girl explained, and then my father chased them all away when my mother died. Eliza sighed heavily again. Cindy sighed too, looking around sadly, yes, there was a family, there was prosperity. And then disaster came, and it all started to collapse like a house of cards. They went into the house. And the first thing that caught their attention was the mess. And then their noses were hit by the strong smell of booze. The master was asleep on the sofa in the living room. Eliza approached the man and patted him on the shoulder, Daddy, get up, the girl called out to him piteously, but he only mumbled something unintelligible. Cindy stood indecisive, not knowing what to do. Eliza, getting nowhere, began to cry. She curled up in a ball on the chair and cried, looking at her drunken father. Cindy couldn't leave the girl here. And the police call, she decided to postpone it. Let's go to my house, she said to the little girl with determination. What about dad? The girl asked in confusion, and raised her tearful eyes to the woman. Cindy flinched again at that look, as if Alvin had looked at her. And daddy will wake up tomorrow and come to my place for you. Cindy wrote a note with the address where to look for Eliza, her phone number, then they left with the girl. Eliza was really happy to go visit this nice aunt. For some reason, the little girl was fine with her, calm. For the first time in three years, Cindy that day baked pizza, boiled a real borscht, then she and Eliza went to the store and bought all sorts of tasty and not so useful things. And crisps, and chocolate, and sodas, sometimes you can, Cindy smiled at the girl winking. She smiled back conspiratorially. And Cindy suddenly realized that it was the first time she had smiled in three years. After bathing Eliza and wrapping her in her dressing gown, they sat on the bed, watched cartoons and ate delicious food. And then they remembered borscht. And putting the girl to bed, Cindy remembered that some of her son's things she hadn't yet taken to the country. She pulled out a book of stories from a precious box. Cindy read her a few stories, and Eliza stayed awake. She kept listening and listening. I missed fairy tales so much, the girl finally whispered. My mother used to read to me. She cried, and Cindy stopped talking, and gently stroked the little girl's head, Aunt Cindy, who do you have there, at the cemetery? Why did you go there? Eliza suddenly remembered. Son and husband, said Cindy. This little girl was so wise and had already faced grief, they understood each other. Son, whispered Eliza, falling asleep. He's probably in heaven, like my mother. In heaven, sighed Cindy. And they're fine there. Don't think about them. Sleep, little one. And Eliza, out of the blue, fell asleep. And Cindy, nestled next to her, fell asleep too. She was dreaming of Alvin and Perry. They were walking in the park, laughing, eating ice cream. And it felt so good. She didn't want the dream to end. And early in the morning, she was woken up by a phone call. Cindy couldn't understand at first, who was calling her. 
who was the man swearing into the receiver. Then she looked to the side and saw Eliza sleeping sweetly. Cindy came back to reality, remembering everything that had happened yesterday. Yes, her son and her husband would only appear to her in her dreams from now on. She shook her head, got up and went to the kitchen with her phone. Don't shout, please, she said into the receiver. Who are you? Who am I? exploded her interlocutor. Who are you? You stole my daughter. Ah, you are Eliza's father, Cindy understood, and then began to speak confidently, even harshly. What is your name? Sheldon? So listen, Sheldon. I found your daughter yesterday at the cemetery. Doesn't it surprise you that a six-year-old is alone in a cemetery? It's not a normal situation. I brought her to your house yesterday, and what did I see? A father, lying there senseless, in a drunken state. How could I trust you with a child? And thank God I didn't call the police. In fact, I can still do that. Don't call the police, the man said suddenly. I'm on my way to your house right now. Okay, Cindy nodded. After he finished the conversation, he suddenly reached for the frying pan. For breakfast it is necessary to make some pancakes. Alvin liked them very much. Eliza would probably like them too. And already, within half an hour, the pleasant aromas of pancakes were spreading through the apartment. And then the doorbell rang. A strange man was standing in the doorway. I'm Sheldon. I called you. Is my daughter with you? I'm a bit worried, he asked. Cindy looked at the stranger carefully. Yes, yesterday he was a completely pathetic man. Drunk, wrinkled. And now in front of her stood a handsome young man. Clean-shaven, neatly dressed. Yes, he was obviously hungover, but he wasn't a degenerate alcoholic, as Cindy had assumed. She led him into the apartment. In the kitchen they had a conversation. Cindy told him about the circumstances in which she had met Eliza. Sheldon listened with his head bowed. Finally, he spoke. The man said that he used to have a happy family, a beautiful wife, a daughter. He had a good job at a trading company. He was earning excellent money, so he could build a house, buy a car, and there was no sign of danger. One day, my wife fainted, was taken to the hospital, was examined. And then it turned out that Catherine was in the third stage of cancer. Everything was asymptomatic, that's why they didn't realize in time. And no amount of money saved her. Charlene died. And I was so sad, Sheldon tells with pain in his voice, I felt like I had nothing to live for. And when I served drinks, I felt better. At work they tolerated me, and now they still tolerate my wandering. Thanks to management. But I can't stop. I drink, and I forget everything. What about the daughter? Cindy asked sternly. She seemed to me to be small, she doesn't understand anything yet, she stays in the gardens mostly until evening. She sleeps at home, only on weekends with me. I didn't even know she went to the cemetery when I was drunk. Nobody told me about it. What about the neighbors? Relatives? Nobody knew? Neither my late wife nor I have any next of kin in town. And the neighbors? We're all pretty isolated out there. But Eliza always came back. I didn't notice her absence. You didn't notice, Cindy grinned. You should drink less, you're judging me. You can't even imagine what kind of pain it is, the loss of a loved one. I can't imagine, Cindy said sadly. I have a five-year-old son buried in that cemetery and a husband. And you want to talk to me about grief? You have a sense of life, and I don't. You just have to take it in your hands and live for your daughter. Sheldon looked at the woman in shock, then whispered. Forgive me, I didn't know. And my daughter. When I didn't find her at home this morning, I almost went crazy. I was so afraid I might lose her. They were silent. Then Eliza came into the room. Sleepy in Cindy's t-shirt, the girl looked strange. Daddy? The little girl raised her eyebrows in surprise. When did you come? Not long ago, smiled Sheldon and stretched out his arms. Come to me, sweetie. The little girl ran to him jumped on his lap and wrapped her arms around his neck, Daddy, I love you so much. But I feel so bad when you're like this. My daughter, I promise I won't be like this anymore. Cindy looked at them thoughtfully, reliving her story. Then she came to her senses and suggested breakfast. Cindy, we'll probably keep you, Sheldon got up. You probably have to go to work. I called the boss last night and took the day off, she shook her head. So, have your tea in silence. And I must be at work already, because the boss's patience is not infinite. I also have to get my daughter ready for kindergarten. Eliza, let's go, Sheldon hurried towards the exit. Let Eliza stay with me today, 
suddenly suggested Cindy. May I? Sheldon froze indecisively, and Eliza looked delightedly at Cindy. It's possible, smiled the woman. So, sit down, all of you, and drink tea with pancakes. Hurrah, with pancakes! exclaimed Eliza. I like them so much. Me too, admitted Sheldon shyly. And they had breakfast together. It's been a few weeks, even months. Cindy and Sheldon became friends. The man stopped drinking. Cindy stopped tormenting herself with memories and went to the cemetery. He spent more and more time with Eliza and became attached to the girl. All the confessions between Sheldon and Cindy were left behind. And somewhere in the heavens, kind eyes were watching them and sincerely wished them happiness, mutual. Because it hurts when loved ones can't let go of their sadness. Though they must let it go, for their earthly road is still long. Dear all, thank you very much for your attention, and if you enjoyed the story, then please feel free to support me with a like and post your thoughts in the comments. Have a wonderful evening and all the best to you all. See you soon. Bye.